Welcome to the Potter Blog site. It's Saturday, September the 10th, 2011. I have here what I believe is some vitally important information that we can show that a uh, meltdown, a China syndrome, if you will, occurred on Fukushima approximately August 11th or August 12th, and that we were able to detect the after effects of that China syndrome here in St. Louis on August 20th. On August 20th, we had the highest short life, half life detection of radioactive material and rain that uh, we've ever had, three times higher than previous. It's 178 times higher in background, which equates, equates to uh, 1.78 milliarms per hour. Uh, this is a level that if you were out in this rain, the federal government would warn pregnant women to avoid this level. So that gives you an idea of how high this was. I don't think I've ever heard of a warning from the federal government for women to avoid rain, pregnant women to avoid rain. At the time I made this video on August 20th, I said, stay out of the rain. This data may be indicative of a recent significant radiological event in Fukushima. Well, I now believe that event to be a meltdown. And I believe that meltdown occurred on August 11th or August 20th. Uh, let's go to the data where I can tie this together. On Thursday, August 11th, there was a 5.8 earthquake in Japan. And if you can see here from this map, here's Fukushima, here's the center of this earthquake. Around this same time period, we have reports from two sources, and this report occurred on August 15th, that there's crack and steam has been coming from the ground, venting from the ground, steam, radioactive steam venting from the ground on Fukushima. Uh, it's attributed, attributed to two different sources and that it occurred in early August. This report is on August 15th. Well, early August, August 11th is when we had this earthquake in, in Fukushima. Since then, we've had data just coming out recently in the last few days that uh, radioactive iodine-131 was uh, detected in and around Fukushima at four different locations on August 15th through the August 25th. Uh, the radioactive iodine was mostly detected in uh, radioactive sewage sludge four cities. Put a map up of those four cities. Here's Fukushima. And you can see where these detections occurred. Here and here. So these detections surround. And again, the detections, uh, the samples were taken August 15th through August the 25th. And what makes it key is that they're in sewer sludge. So most of this radioactive iodine had to pass through people or enter the sewer system. So there's a delay time, both in small delay time and weather travel, a little bit longer delay time for it to get through the sewer system to the collecting station. And one aspect I can show that bounds that is here's a uh, reading from August the 25th, and this is an onshu, if I said that correctly, and here's the radioactive iodine detection. The previous sample was taken on August the 11th, and they have a no detect for radioactive iodine-131. Iodine-131, again, is a key indicator that a nuclear fission is occurring. So given that this uh, is, again, in sewer sludge, I would estimate that if it had fallen on August 9th or 10th, that would have been any earlier than that and it would have been detected by 811. So we've bound the detection initial falling somewhere between 8, 9, 10, or 11 all the way up to the 15th of, uh, of September, I'm oh, sorry, of August. So basically what we have now is uh, an earthquake August 11th, detections of radioactive iodine in the same time period indicating fallout and to show how this would travel to St. Louis here is a image of the uh, jet stream this is a historical image and this will run here in a minute this is 
August 2011, 11th. And I'm going to run this animation for 10 days. Again, this is not a model. This is the real jet stream data from that time period. And what we have here is you're looking at the North Pole dead center. Down here is Fukushima. Over here on the left-hand side of the screen is Fukushima. Over here on the right-hand side is St. Louis. Now, one thing you'll notice is, if you follow this latitude line all the way around here, is that St. Louis and Fukushima are functionally on the same latitude. So I'm going to start the, uh, the GIF here. These gray areas are high wind, the jet stream. Now, if you see even by August 14th, we have a high jet stream pushing across. We'll go let it run some more. So now we're at August 19th. So we've already had at this time frame approximately seven or eight days for it to travel. And you can see we've got a high jet stream wind. Now what happened in the same time frame is there have been large amounts of uh, detections. There was a, basically a step function jump in detections of radioactive material and RADNET all across the jet stream. And also individual reports of uh, high radioactivity and rainfall across uh, the northern part of North America coinciding again with the jet stream. So we'll step through this and we'll go to the next day, August 20th. And again, this is the day when we had the rain, when we had the uh, 178 times background rainfall here in uh, St. Louis. And these clouds, the thunderstorms, actually came down and followed this path into St. Louis. So we've got a direct connection from this melt through to St. Louis. Now let me give you a little better idea exactly what's occurring and how this short half-life radiation could come out of uh, Fukushima be detected here in St. Louis. And the detection here we had in St. Louis, I've been able to confirm this from, uh, uh, from uh, analyzing half-life data, was of uh, uh, the daughters of uh, Radon 222. Now if we look again at this drawing of uh, how a meltdown would be, basically we have the reactor here, parts of the reactor core melting through the bedrock and going into the groundwater and then we have cracks and steam rising up out of the ground as reported in Japan at the same time frame now there's two methods or two modes of uh, how radon could result out of this event to be detected at such high levels in St. Louis first is and it's probably a combination of these two. You know, it is possible for radon to be, I believe it is possible, there are simulations that could show this, for uh, radon to be created directly out of, uh, not necessarily out of a fission reaction, but uh, other nuclear reactions that occur. Either direct creation of astatine-222 or direct creation of radon. Now, it's one possibility. The other possibility is that uh, radon, especially radon and groundwater, has been used in Japan for a long time to uh, try to predict earthquakes. And when you have earthquakes, that shakes up the ground and creates a lot of capability for uh, radon to come through. So lots of times there are high fluctuations of radon in the groundwater in Japan during an earthquake. So in Fukushima, as this melt through occurs, and we have uh, nuclear fission occurring in this groundwater and rising up the steam, it's potential that this groundwater is heavily laden with radon. So basically it operates as a heat engine. So as the core enters the water and it's spewing out its own radioactivity, on top of it, it's gonna spew out any radioactive radon that's in this water table and it's going to shoot up through the surface. And that gives us our detections here in St. Louis, as you saw through the jet stream. Now, I've long held that the short half-life fallout that uh, we detect here in St. Louis is proportional to the longer half-life fallout. So basically, it's a canary in a coal mine. So we detect the short half-life fallout because it's easy to detect, but the harder to detect fallout is mixed in there. 
Now, what made this detection we had here in St. Louis so different than the previous ones is the short, the half-life was shorter. Uh, normally, we've been detecting a 46-minute half-life, which could be a variety of things. But uh, the detection we had that was 178 times background was a 36.4-minute half-life, which the composite half-life, which exactly matches what we would expect out of radon daughters. So, what we have here is a capability to measure what the fallout here is in the United States via sensitive Geiger counters. And what it tells me is, is that we should be very concerned about what's coming down out of the rain. Unfortunately, RADNET and EPA is FOA, and that means flat on their ass. The EPA censors RADNET data. So even though we've seen spikes and increases in uh, background radiation all across the uh, parts of North America, especially those affected by the jet stream during this time frame of this meltdown, or China syndrome melt through, the uh, EPA censors the data. As a matter of fact, they've even stopped collecting it in most places and they've made it hard to find. Now here's an example before uh, before this melt through, this goes through uh, June the 29th. And I point out here where we had several high detections, and all these little blocks are is where the EPA censored the data so those high detections don't show up on the charts. What I'm calling for is for EPA to release the raw RADNET data so people can analyze it and get a better idea of where the dangerous radioactive fallout is raining down the country and accumulating because it's not accumulating evenly distributed across the country you should be concerned